All right, we are going to talk about adult chest disorders part two. Yesterday we talked about pneumonia and sort of chronic bronchitis, acute bronchitis, that sort of thing. Um, you'll hear about asthma and COPD next to kind of round out the pulmonary stuff. But this really is one of the more difficult topics that we deal with in the emergency department, which is pulmonary embolism. Couple, I'll tell you, I, w I will guarantee, absolutely guarantee in your practice during the lifetime of your emergency medicine career, you are gonna miss a PE or two or three or 10. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, you're gonna probably miss some because a couple of you here in this room probably have one right now. You know, if you're having a little shortness of breath, a little twinge of chest pain, you're gonna break it up yourself, you're gonna be fine, it's not gonna do you any harm. The reality, PE is a really, really, really a big conundrum for that, those of us that work in the emergency department. Because it can kill people, because it's a serious disorder, and because it happens enough that you know you see it, we tend to get overly focused on the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. We over, we over test, we over image by far. The data says that we actually are ordering four to even five times as many CTPAs as we did just 10 years ago, and we're not picking up any more PEs. We're, we're basically doing a lot of imaging for something that we're really worried about, understandably, but we can't, we can't do it the way we're doing it. So a couple of things about the approach to pulmonary embolism. With the, knowing that you're going to miss one, or two, or three, or 10. Knowing that that's the milieu, that that is what, because it's just a tough little bugger, pulmonary embolism, you need to have a systematic, reproducible, medical legally and medically justifiable practice that you do when you approach somebody who might have a pulmonary embolism. What I'm gonna do is walk you through the things that I think are helpful to that. If you can say, every time that diagnosis crosses your mind, I do a risk stratification first. If appropriate, then I do a D-dimer. If it's not appropriate, then I don't because of my risk stratification. The testing I do is this. If you can, if you can justify it, <clears throat> you'll be fine even if you miss a pulmonary embolism because the reality is you will. You're going to do it. So <clears throat> the first thing you have to do when it comes to pulmonary embolism, before you put your pen to paper or your mouse to clicking any kind of box, is decide how likely do you think that person has a pulmonary embolism? What's the likelihood? Is it no risk, low risk, moderate or intermediate risk, or high risk? You have to make that decision first because everything else is predicated on that. Everything else comes out of that decision. So, and, and I'll tell you, the hardest dis sort of differentiator in those four is the difference between no risk and low risk. Somebody who comes in saying, my chest is tight, I'm having trouble breathing, I'm feeling really short of breath, I have asthma, it always hurts when I breathe when I get my asthma attacks, that's asthma. Okay, that's not a pulmonary embolism. Yes, they're having pleuritic pain. Yes, they're feeling short of breath, but that's asthma. It's not a PE. Be really careful with when you cross that threshold because once you go from no risk, I'm doing no tests whatsoever, to low risk, you now embark on a decision tree that commits you sometimes to going all the way down to imaging. So that, the most crucial thing you're gonna do initially is risk stratify. Now, you can do that various ways. You can use one of many scoring criteria set, sets that are out there. Wells is probably the most well-known, but there are many out there. There's the Geneva, there's all kinds of the PERC rule, which we will talk about in a little depth. There's a lot of risk stratification tools available to you. I urge you to use them. I urge you to know the PERC, and then you can pick whichever other one you'd like, but the Wells is probably the most well-known and sort of well-respected of the others. The reason I recommend you do that is that if you use your gestalt alone, you're probably okay. When studies say your gestalt is just as good as those rules, but it's a little hard to explain in court if you do miss a PE or to yourself when someone dies of a PE that you've missed and you have to, you feel terrible, it's just awful, it's terrible. You wanna know that you did the best job you can do. So head-to-head -head data says that physicians, we haven't tested advanced care providers yet, haven't studied that, but physicians, when they're put head-to-head -head with the Wells score or in the Geneva score or any of these scores, our gestalt is about as good. I have a low, a low likelihood, I think, versus the score that says low likelihood. We're pretty good. But what it does is gives you sort of two things that work together. What I like to do is I use something like the Wells, which is this. So I use the Wells. It's decent, it breaks people into groups pretty well, it's pretty decent, but, but then I allow my gestalt to trumpet. So I have this, I go through the wells and people and I use this as a risk stratification tool, but if somebody has a heart rate of 99, 
and I'm worried about a pulmonary embolism, hey, they might not hit the well's cutoff that I need to say I want to work them up, but I'm worried, okay, that, that my gestalt just says it's a PE. So in those, let your gestalt trumpet, but I recommend using a tool. Now, if you use something like the well's, and so, or even your gestalt, and you think it's a low likelihood, not no likelihood, but it's like, ugh, it's about, my life, I think it's 10 to 15% likely. That's my gestalt. I think it's about, it's low. I wouldn't put, you know, my, my entire house on it out there in the roulette wheel, but it's about 10 to 15%. I'm worried enough. It's low, not higher than that. You can use the perk. The perk rule was developed basically to give us a set of people where we say, you know what? I thought about it. Here are some criteria I can look at that they actually meet these criteria. I don't even need to order a D-dimer. I don't need to order anything nothing. I am done. I thought about it. They fall into the I'm worried a little bit category, but I apply this perk rule to them. They're done. I don't even need to order D-dimer if they hit all eight criteria. The key to the perk rule, never use it in somebody who is intermediate or high risk. It wasn't intended for that group and you'll get in trouble. But you can use it for that low risk group and it's wonderful. You will still miss about 2% of PEs, 1.7 actually in the study, but the reality is those people clinically did fine. Okay, they, they, they weren't people that went home and dropped dead. They clinically did fine. So this is a really nice way to help. It, it actually takes out about 30% of patients that you might otherwise work up. It's kind of nice. So low risk clinically, negative perk rule, it all works out fine. All those eight criteria, they hit all eight. It has to be all eight. Can't miss one. It has to be all eight. You're done. Otherwise, if they're low risk and they don't hit the perk rule, or they're intermediate or high risk, now you have to go on and do something. And we'll talk about sort of the, what you do at that point in a minute. The reason people get PEs is, is they basically have stasis, something wrong with their endothelium. Like these days, they're getting clots because we're putting lines in people like crazy. So something's damaged their endothelium, and they're in some sort of hypercoagulable state. We know the people we're worried about, people on hormone replacement therapy, people with cancers. We know the people that we worry about who, to have things like pulmonary embolism and, and DVTs. And the symptoms are what we expect pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, they may get tachycardic, they may be tachypnic, their pulse ox may be low. All of those things are things that you look for. Okay? We all know that's sort of how they present. The key is sort of where do we draw the line saying, gosh, it's definitely pneumonia versus, gosh, I'm just not so sure. This may be a PE, and that's when you have to make the decision of which is which. What do you do? Now, the chest X-ray is helpful, kind of. The chest, if you have somebody who comes in with pleuritic chest pain, a respiratory rate of 24, a pulse ox of 93% and a crystal clear chest X-ray. That's a PE. Clear chest X-rays in somebody with respiratory distress should make you think twice. I'll tell you, if you see a crystal clear chest X-ray with somebody with respiratory distress, it's usually something metabolic or toxic or a PE. Okay, those are the things that make people look like they're short of breath, feel short of breath, and have a negative chest x-ray. Chest x-rays can show all kinds of stuff with PE. Often they'll show a little bit of atelectasis, because if they're having pleuritic pain, they don't breathe as well on that side, they don't expand their lung, and they may get a little atelectasis. You may see things like Westermark sign and Hampton's humps. The reality is if you see these, that's the day you want to be in Vegas, because that's when you're going to want to put your money on a table, because these are so incredibly rare. You hardly ever see these. But these were described back in a day where we didn't have any more sophisticated imaging, and you would see the actual, where, where the, um, the infarct of the lung occurred. That's basically your Hampton's hump. And Westermark sign is where there's oligemia distal to the place where the clot is sitting. This poor bugger got both on their x-ray. This person, somebody has a Hampton's hump from the infarcted lung and a Westermark sign where the clot has stopped blood flow distally and they can't see it on the film. The reality is you hardly ever, ever see these things, rarely if ever. The ECG is something we order a lot too and people are worried about maybe have a PE or have tachycardia or shortness of breath. We get EKGs a lot. If you see right axis, sort of right-sided strain, you see P pulmonale, you see a, 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 the, the S1Q3, T3. If you see all that stuff, basically these kinds of findings, that's a big PE. That's somebody who has enough of a clot burden that they're straining that right side of their heart. So they have a big clot burden in there that's giving these kinds of findings. More often what you see is either nothing or just sinus tachycardia. That S1Q3, T3 thing, that's sort of the list on here on the bottom that tells you, that's great, that's another thing if you see it. Happens about 2% of the time with pulmonary embolism. And it's not specific to PE. Other things can do it as well. But that you can look for it, it's kind of cool if it's there. It is not something you should hang your hat on. And I will tell you the other thing that'll get, us, get you in trouble, in fact it is so discouraged now that it is out of most guidelines completely, is getting a blood gas. 
The problem with blood gases, in the, even in somebody with a significant PE, it can be rock cold normal 10% of the time. So if you get a blood gas back that's normal, you may feel better about it. Oh, maybe it's not a PE. When you're already worried, it has nothing to do with it. it you should not be getting blood gases in PEs because all it does is hurt you. It doesn't help you. And the reality is your pulse ox will tell you if they're hypoxic. That's what you need. That, that's really what you want to know. So the blood gas actually is no longer recommended at all in this sort of algorithm of working up PE. What is in there, however, is D-dimer testing. Now, D-dimer testing, for a lot, for there's about 10 years worth of literature that was sort of arguing about or discussing or debating what's the best kind of test to do. Look, ELISA testing, blah, 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 latex testing. The reality is most of us now have very reliable D-dimer testing. The tests that we have now are fourth generation D-dimer testing. They're quite well done. The, that, that's not the issue. The issue is when should you get it and what do you do with it? So right now, all of you are making, making clots and breaking them down all the time. And since you've been sitting all day long, you're probably making a few more clots than usual. And you're breaking them down all the time. So D-dimer is this breakdown product of clot. It's, you do it all the time. It's part of what you're doing just keeping yourself healthy. If you have an increased clot burden, you will increase your D-dimer. That's the theory of why it might be helpful in venous thromboembolic disease. The problem is a lot of things make it be positive. Okay, a lot of things will actually bump your D-dimer. So for instance, false positive pregnancy. Pregnancy definitely raises your D-dimer. Starting an IV. They did a study that looked, checked D-dimer levels before and after just starting an IV. And there were not a ton, but about 10% of the people in that study bumped their D-dimer into the positive range, the cutoff range, where we would be worried about it in, in a clinical setting. The key to D-dimer, the only time to use a D-dimer is in a low-risk patient that didn't perk out. Now you're stuck. Okay, they didn't hit the perk rule. I need to do something. It's a low-risk person. I can get a D-dimer in that person. If the D-dimer is negative, I'm finished. If it's positive, I still need to go on and do more testing. So in our stratification scheme, we risk stratify first. Low risk person, perk them out. If they perk out, you're finished. If they don't fit the perk rule, get a D-dimer. If that D-dimer is negative, you're finished. Excellent. You've now weeded out oh, as, as high as maybe 40% of the people that we wor worry about for PE. If they're low risk and a positive D-dimer or moderate or high risk people, now you move on. And don't get a D-dimer in that moderate to high risk group, especially the high risk group, because if it's negative, it's going to make you feel better and it shouldn't. The test itself isn't good enough in a high risk person to say a negative D-dimer means I'm done. It doesn't. It doesn't. The test itself, that's a problem with the test. It's not a problem with the person, it's a problem with the test. It just isn't good enough in that situation. So D-dimer's role is in that low-risk person who doesn't perk out. You can get it in that person. If it's negative, you're done. If it's positive, you're not. You have to continue to do more tests. Now, what should you do? That means you have to do an imaging study. You have the option these days of a CT, well, we have, actually, there's one more option, but you have a CTPA or a VQ scan. Now, VQ scans sound kind of antique and quaint and cute. We did, for a long time, we didn't get them because we had this wonderful new CT scan, this beautiful pictures that we could get, except that there's a lot of radiation that goes with the CT scan. And it radiates an area of high risk for cancer for women, which is the breast tissue. So you'd like not to do CTPAs and radiate people if you don't have to. That's where VQ scanning has kind of come back into the, into the fore. So it is something you can do in somebody with a normal chest X-ray. You're worried about a PE, you can do a VQ scan. The problem with VQ scanning is it's not as available as, as CT scans right down the hall. You just kind of roll them down there and it's super quick to get the scan. We often will do that, but know that VQ scan is a, is a reasonable alternative to get in somebody with a normal chest X-ray. Abnormal chest X-ray, the VQ scan is a little harder to interpret, so it probably isn't useful in that group. So CTPA is okay. Just know VQ scan actually now has a role more than it used to. And what do you do if someone's pregnant? Okay, first of all, no D-dimers in pregnant women. If you're worried about a PE, the American College of OBGYN and, uh, of Obstetrics and Gynecology says don't do it. Don't do it because it's going to be false positive too often and you'll image too many women. You'd, you'll go down the path too, too often. If you're worried about it's a woman, a pregnant woman having a PE, the best thing to do is start with the legs. Even if they're asymptomatic, start with the legs. Get an ultrasound of both legs if they're equal. If there's a symptomatic one, certainly go for that one. But get an ultrasound of both legs because it'll be positive anywhere between 8 and about 20% of the time, even if there are no symptoms there. So if, that, if you find the clot there, you don't need to do anything up here. 
you're done. You've diagnosed thromboembolic disease. If they have you know, symptoms that go with the PE, it does good. We'll treat you. Okay, we got you covered. So that, that's probably the best way to start. What the ACOG is recommending, although this has been bandied about a lot these days, is to do a CTPA. So if you have, if, if that's negative, you're still worried about a, P, a PE, they're recommending CTPA. I will tell you this is debated, whether a VQ is better or a CT is better. But right now, the most recent iteration I've seen is that they recommend a CTPA. Now, this is an algorithm that we pulled from the web that's actually an a European algorithm that some people in the United States are using. And this walks you through exactly what I just talked about. A couple things about this algorithm to note. If you take the left sort of hand thing, so I'm worried about a PE, I'm going down that left pathway. Okay, I decide first, the first decision is always risk stratify. I decide it's low risk. This algorithm adds moderate risk to this left side of the decision tree. That is maybe justifiable. There's some newer literature that's looking at clinical outcomes for PE, and that may actually be justifiable. I don't quite get on this bandwagon yet. For me, moderate risk, I don't get a D-dimer. Okay? Moderate risk, I go on an image. This one, it lumps them together. But you can kind of walk through what's what on this particular algorithm. The other thing to note on this algorithm is the far right side. So you just got off a 20-hour plane flight from Africa. Your right leg is really swollen. You suddenly develop s severe shortness of breath. You're hypoxic. You're tachypnic. I have a Hampton's hump on your chest X-ray. I, first of all, you don't get a D-dimer in that person, right? Don't need it. But then I get a CTPA of you, and it's negative. I'm not done. You are so high risk. There, there is, there's nothing else that can be causing those symptoms. There's virtually nothing I can think of that can cause that kind of symptom complex. The CTPA, while good, isn't perfect. If the breath is not held well, if the dilode isn't good, they may not see the pulmonary embolism. So know that CTPA negative in that, my God, it has to be a PE person. You often need to go on to a another study of some sort, either image the legs with ultrasound, you get a VQ scan, God forbid, you may even need a pulmonary angiogram. That super, super, super high risk person, a negative CTPA isn't good enough. It's not good enough. You often need two negative tests to really say it's not there. So here's sort of what they look like. The top one is the CTPA. It shows a little tiny clot with a little arrow pointing at it there on the, on the left side of your picture. And the VQ scan is on the bottom. The reality is you only need the perfusion scan. You don't really need the ventilation scan. If their chest x-ray is negative, they just inject the isotope, take the pictures, and you're done. See how the perfusion is. Now, treating people with PE, the big conundrum is diagnosing it. That's our big conundrum. The treatment's not that big a deal. The treatment basically is heparin, either infused, unfractionated, or low molecular weight heparin. I will tell you that the newer anticoagulants are hovering as far as being used to treat DVT and PE. That's coming down the pike, whole separate deal right now. But right now, heparin is what's recommended. You can treat some patients as outpatients. Most of the time, we admit these days. But I'll tell you, they're, in Canada, they send them home frequently. If somebody is young, healthy, has good cardiopulmonary reserve, they're not that hypoxic, they're not that symptomatic, you can send them home with low, low molecular weight heparin, bridge them to Coumadin. So these patients actually are fine to send home. But most of the time, we, as a standard of care, will admit people in the United States. Should you lice them? The indications right now for lysing using a fibrinolytic in somebody who's had a PE is basically a life-threatening, basically coding person with a PE. So that person who just got off that plane from Africa now clutches their chest, gets very short of breath, and drops dead in a PEA arrest. That's the kind of person that, that you should be using a lytic in. Right now, that's the only indication for lytics in PE. I will tell you, though, keep your ear to the ground. Um, I'm not thrilled about this idea, but there was a paper presented at SAN this last year that looked at submassive PEs and outcomes in people who got lysed for submassive PEs. It's not going to kill you, okay? It's just a, a goodly PE, but it's, just, it, but it's not going to kill you. They had better symptomatic outcomes in the long run when they got lysed. This is not standard of care yet. But you may hear people talk about it when you go back home. Somebody may say, well, don't you want to lice that PE? It looks like it's kind of big. You know, it's a, it's a big, you know, main, it's, it's, a, it's a segmental branch clot. Don't you want to lice that? Right now, it is not standard of care, but please keep an ear to the ground. It's coming down the pike. And unfortunately, it's going to mean we need more, st more imaging studies to see how big clots are to make the decision whether to lice or not. Right now, it's not there, but it may be coming down the pike. So keep your ear to the ground. 
Now, DVT is usually where the PEs come from. Okay, they usually come from your lower extremities. And this is all a continuum of disease. It's venous thromboembolic disease. It's all a continuum of this. This is actually a common cardiovascular problem. Okay, venous thromboembolic disease is a big problem. They're, of course, intimately related because they go from there to here most often. And signs and symptoms of DVT, this, the approach is very similar to the same thing you have with PE. Here's what they look like. And I'll tell you, every once in a while, you're going to see somebody who just doesn't have just a swollen leg. You're going to see somebody with a huge blue leg or a huge white leg. Those are phlegmasia cases. The clot is so bad and so occlusive that they cannot perfuse their leg. It's, it's either because they, they have so much swelling they can't get flow in, or they have so much flow in that can't come out, it gets basically stasis. That's a phlegmasia case. One's Alba, one's, one's Dolan's, but the reality is those things are life-threatening. That top picture on the right looks quite suspicious. Be worried about that, and, if it, and it's usually exquisitely tender because it's ischemic. That is an emergency. That needs a thrombectomy. That is a true, honest-to-God emergency if the DVT is that bad. Most aren't. Okay, most aren't. What you need to do is the same thing you would do with pulmonary embolism. Okay, the exact same thing. Risk stratify first. Okay, it's somebody with raging cellulitis and their, it's, you know, their ankle's a little bit swollen. That's probably just raging cellulitis out of DVT. Somebody who has no evidence of cellulitis and their leg is swollen from the, from the groin down. That's much more suspicious. And then there's certain factors you'll put into it. Clinical risk factors are like this. Another Wells thing. What Wells did with this is it used to be low, intermediate, and high. They've dispensed with that, both now with PE and DVT. It's likely or unlikely. They have gotten to a cutoff, and they say, unlikely if it's lower than this, likely if it's higher than this. That makes it very clean for you to determine what to do. So this is the Wells criteria for DVT. You're going to risk stratify first. If they are low risk, you're going to D-dimer. If it's negative, you're finished. If it's positive, you'll bring them back and re-image them in about a week. Make sure they're okay. So that's what you do first. And ultrasonography is the way to go. Absolutely the way to go. Incredibly sensitive. In fact, we do our own in our emergency department. Where it's not rocket science to do an ultrasound for DVTs. It's very, very easy. It's, it is technician dependent, but most people's groins aren't huge, so you can actually see the vessels pretty well. If, they're, if they end up with a DVT, you're done. You anticoagulate them, it's finished. And these patients can often be treated as outpatients. It's pretty routine these days to treat DVT as an outpatient. Unless there's some major comorbid risk factor, it's very common to treat them as outpatients. Here's what the ultrasound looks like. What they're doing is they're looking at the vessels, it's not that hard, and then they're pushing down. And then they're having patients take breaths, and they're looking what happens to the waveform. So basically looking at what happens to these vessels and their compressibility. Really easy to do. It's actually fabulous. Here's the diagnostic algorithm for DVT, and it's another one you can walk yourself through. The reality is it's likely to get to your risk stratification first. Low likelihood, you're basically going to go ahead and get a, a D-dimer. If it's negative, you're finished. You're done. You're done. It's over. If it's positive, you're going to get an ultrasound. Okay, that's, it's easy. If it's a likely DVT, then you're going to go ahead and D-dimer, you don't have to get if it's a likely DVT. I just go right to the study. Okay, so if I say, no, it's a high likelihood of a DVT, they get the study done. Easy. Okay, easy to do. Very, very simple. All right. The other few little weird things that can happen in your chest. Spontaneous pneumothorax. That's that string bean kid you grew up with who was, you know, six feet tall at 12 years of age who happens to have Marfan syndrome who drops a lung. Okay, spontaneous pneumothorax absolutely can happen. It happen. The groups it happens in are the tall, skinny people, okay, people that, so the, that little string bean person, or people that have COPD, common, they pop a bleb and that's that, they can pop along, or people that do drugs, okay, people that smoke crack cocaine, people that huff, okay, huffers can get spontaneous pneumothorax. They drop a lung and they come in with pleuritic Left-sided chest pain, for instance. They got, it hurts when I breathe, I feel short of breath. That's why your initial chest x-ray, ruling out PE, when you look at that, is helpful. If it shows a drop lung, you're done. It's not a PE, good on you, you dropped your lung, easy. And I'll tell you one thing, you, you'll listen for breath sounds. And often you'll hear unequal breath sounds, but don't let unequal breath sounds make the diagnosis. The chest x-ray makes the diagnosis. You right now, every single one of you in this room, could, I, I, I could have your neighbor put their stethoscope on. I could have them listen to your lungs, both sides, and you could make no breath sounds on one side. You can, if you splint, 
basically move air only on one side. I don't hear any air moving on the other side. So that unequal breath sounds and somebody's having a lot of pleuritic chest pain doesn't mean they dropped a lung. It just means they're not moving air on that side because they're splinting on that side. So the unequal breath sounds are helpful if it's there, maybe. The chest x-ray is what actually makes the diagnosis for you. And you're going to look for those lung markings. And we all have gotten burned on these, the little tiny pneumo where you didn't track it all the way up. It's why when you look at chest x-rays, you you're very, very systematic every time. Does the lung go all the way out to the chest wall? You won't miss PEs, or uh, excuse me, uh, pneumothoraces if that's the case, if you look every time. And treating these, the spontaneous ones, these days most of them are getting pigtails. They're not getting a big old huge chest, uh, uh, actually tube thoracostomy. They're not getting a chest tube. They're not even getting a little tiny chest tube. They're getting a pigtail. Pigtails work beautifully. You can even aspirate them. Okay, aspirate them, put in a little Heimlich valve, make sure they don't reaccumulate, send them home, bring them back tomorrow, take the Heimlich valve out, you're done. Okay, so there's very many ways of approaching these. They do not all need a chest tube. Most of them don't get them anymore. Now, what you don't want them to do is to have a tension pneumo. That bottom chest x-ray is something that should never be gotten. You don't want them to have a tension pneumo. So what you'd like to do is get the air out of there. Tension pneumo is where the air gets in. There's no way for it to get out. It gets trapped and shoves everything over. If you see somebody's chest x-ray with a pneumothorax, but you watch them and they're getting a little more tachycardic and a little more tachypnic, and now their blood pressure starts to fall, and they are getting more tachycardic, that's a tension. Okay, that's something you need to stick a needle in their chest right now. Otherwise, it's not a right now deal. If it's just a spontaneous pneumo, you can stick a pigtail in and life is good. Now, hemoptysis. I'll tell you, hemoptysis, it's, we use hemoptysis as a, as a criterion to put masks on people in our waiting room because we see so much tuberculosis where I work. We, I don't care if you come in with an ingrown toenail. You get a screen, a bunch of questions asked of you that we've actually validated that says, if you have a certain number of points you get on this screen, we put a mask on you and we send you to x-ray. One of the things in that list is hemoptysis. Hemoptysis comes in sort of two flavors. You can either have basically minor hemoptysis, and that's just a little bit. That's the streaky bits in my sputum kind of hemoptysis, and that's very, very common. And the most common cause of that is chronic bronchitis or even acute bronchitis, coughing a lot, getting little streaks of blood in my sputum. That's actually common. That's not a life threat. For us, we worry about TB, so we make sure the x-ray is negative. But other, th other things can do it as well. Neoplasms can do it, et cetera. But that's not big hemoptysis. That's little hemoptysis. The big hemoptysis is scary stuff. The definitions vary. One of the definitions is 50 cc's in a single cough or 600 cc's over 24 hours. Can you imagine? That's a unit of blood over 24 hours that you're coughing out. That is a huge amount of blood. Massive hemoptysis is scary, scary stuff. This is the minor hemoptysis algorithm, I'm gonna skip that, but massive, if you see somebody, so I've seen three massive hemoptysis deaths in my career, it, that you do not ever forget them. You never forget them. But all three were from malignancies, all three had eroded through, but what kills people also is tuberculous lesions that erode through. Those, rasp those little, little cavitary lesions often will erode into an artery and they'll bleed to death. Hemoptysis is what will kill them. So what you do if somebody has massive hemoptysis, so say somebody comes in, they know they have left-sided lung cancer. Okay, I know I have left-sided lung cancer. I coughed up some blood yesterday. Today, I brought, see the little jar I brought? I coughed this all up today. That's a very concerning person. What you're gonna do is you're gonna call, if you're, if you're in a, a place where you need to transfer somebody who might go down, transfer this person, okay, get them out. Because you need anesthesia, you'd like to let your cardiothoracic surgeons know about this, you'd like to have interventional radiology know about this, so they can do something like an embolization if they need to. Because if the thing cuts loose, they drown in their own blood, it's horrendous. So what you do is you get all hands on deck, people all know that the patient is there, Tell them what you're dealing with. And then if a patient really does cut loose, you do a series of things. You put them bad side down. So this gentleman who says, I have left-sided lung cancer, his left side goes down, so the blood will go into the bad side already. You, if you need to intubate them, you try to selectively intubate the other side. So if it happens to be somebody with a left-sided something, it's easy to right-side intubate. We do it all the time by accident because that takeoff is really, really shallow. It's easy to get it right down the right side. Much harder if you have to go down the left. But try to intubate selectively that side. So keep bleeding side down, selectively intubate the other side, correct any coagulopathy you can if, if they're coagulopathic, and then get them to someone who could do something definitive. It can be an absolute, absolute nightmare. All right, on that note, <laughs> thank you very much.